Hello and welcome to the inaugural World 101X live stream. I'm Gerhard, your course director, and with me today on the panel are Fern, your course moderator. You'll have seen her on the discussion board. Um, professor of Anthropology at the University of Queensland, David Trigger, and Research Fellow in Anthropology, um, Richard Martin. And you will have, you'll remember these two from episode four when we went into the Gulf country in northern Queensland with them. Now we've got a bunch of questions here, but also get involved on the live stream on YouTube and on the edX platform and ask questions that we'll uh, try to answer briefly and engagingly here on the panel. Now one of the first questions that attracted a lot of um, upvoting and interest uh, on the discussion forum was a question about the role of women in indigenous society. And I'd like to start with that one. I'll just read out the question from Kathleen W. And the question goes, I'm curious about the role of women in Australian indigenous society, both historically and currently. Do they have the same educational opportunity as men? And if so, do they return to their communities to take up a leadership role? I think the, the question broadly is looking at you know, gender differences in indigenous society and um, authority and leadership um, that women are, are not taking up at present. So maybe we'll just go around, start with you, Fern. Sure. Um, can I just start by saying it's a really good question and I'm really glad that someone asked it, particularly because, and I think that this was pointed out in one of the responses to that question on the discussion board, but in terms of uh, the people that were interviewed as part of that episode that Richard and David were involved in, um, in terms of Aboriginal voices, we've heard a lot from Aboriginal men within the MOOC and not a lot from Aboriginal women. So I think it's really good to highlight the fact that we're not seeing the full spectrum within the MOOC of the different gendered voices that are, that are out there. Um, in terms of responding to the question, it's a, it's a very complex uh, question to respond to, uh, largely because there are so many different Aboriginal societies within Australia, so there is no one Aboriginal culture, there's no one uh, role that we see Aboriginal women taking up right across Australia, it's very different. Um, and particularly in terms of changes throughout history. So we, we're now in a, in a situation where uh, the majority of the indigenous population in Australia um, lives in urban areas. And so obviously that's wrought a lot of cultural changes on uh, many indigenous Australian societies. Uh, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to pick up on in response to the question. And one is in terms of uh, the way that anthropologists uh, can form relationships with different societies or different gender groups and the fact that that's a really important thing to take into consideration when we're doing field work. So this is something that takes us right back to, um, for example, the work of Bronislav Mal Malinowski in the Trobriand Islands and something that he was criticised for a lot uh, later down the track was the fact that he completely ignored the place of women um, in that, in that society. And so we see this very partial, very one-sided account of, of how that society functioned. Um, so I think that particularly with um, indigenous Australian societies, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of gendered division of, of knowledge, for instance. So there's a lot of bodies of knowledge that are only available to women or only available to men and that aren't able to be shared with members of, of a different gender. Um, and so that's something that we need to be sensitive to as anthropologists is the fact that we may not be getting um, a, full, a full picture or a full understanding of how knowledge is held by all members across that society because of that gender division. And that's something that's come up um, in a couple of court cases as well. So one of the really famous ones is the Hindmarsh Island bridge case in which there was uh, sacred and, and highly gendered information that was only held by women that was not necessarily able to be shared uh, within a court of law because it would have been um, exposed to, to men as well, which was something that was really problematic for that uh, particular society. Um, but I wonder what other people have to say on that, on that topic as well. Well, perhaps just to add, um I think it's a good illustration of attention for anthropology uh, as to whether anthropology tells it like it is because what we have in a country like Australia and some other countries with indigenous populations 
is quite a lot of gender violence, I have to say, and this has been a major issue of public debate. Mm. And anthropologists are criticised often for always wanting to respect culture and cultural difference because of the great tradition of cultural relativism, which has no doubt been addressed in the course. So anthropologists like me who've worked for a long time in Aboriginal communities sometimes ask ourselves, well, was, was I really telling it like it is in terms of all of the dimensions of gender relations? Mm -hmm. Because in those kinds of settings, just as in many settings across the world, you know, gender relations are not equal necessarily and bad things happen. So I just would add that further point that um, anthropology in a country like Australia today the last decade or so has been pushed to ask and address the hard questions about what might need to change in gender relations in Aboriginal communities, perhaps just as in, in wider parts of the society. So I think it's a good, mm. it's a good point to raise that to raise that issue. But there are as well, and there was a, there was a sub-question within that broader question that I wanted to respond to, and this ties into what you were just saying, David, now as well. But there are a lot of Aboriginal women uh, taking up leadership positions and spearheading campaigns. So one that comes to mind is a campaign against um, ongoing, what's called the ongoing stolen generation in Australia, for instance. And that campaign is very much spearheaded by by Aboriginal women, uh, particularly older Aboriginal women, so a lot of grandmothers, a lot of mothers, um, are, are really taking up, um, I guess, positions of political prominence, not only within their own communities, but at a, at a national level. And we see a lot of strong uh, women Aboriginal voices. Uh, Fiona Foley comes to mind as an Aboriginal artist who has a, 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 um, a big political voice on the national spectrum. Do you think there's a difference between urban and non-urban communities in terms of how leadership positions can be attained. Um, there may be some prominent academics or people who are prominent within the national political discourse, but there may be other people who are prominent within a specific community. Is that a, a disparity still in terms of Aboriginal communities? Uh, yeah, I think that there are different ways in which people have power and, and exercise influence and uh, certainly in the Gulf country where uh, we were a few months ago uh, some of the most influential people with with strong knowledge that I've worked with um, are senior women who, who know place names for places often because they've happened to live longer than their um, contemporary uh, male members of the generation so um, they've risen to hold and exert influence in their society uh, and knowledge about places uh, and to be involved in other types of community work, so getting involved in the school, for example, or, um, or engaging with the, with the wider society in a, a whole host of um, arenas. Mm. Do you have anything else to add before we Just one on? small thing. I think it's important, as always, for anthropology uh, professionals and students to be cautious about romanticising. In this case, we're talking about the other or non-Western cultures. Um, there's the, um, the option there to think of these cultures in the past or now as somehow embodying a greater degree of equality in gender relations and my own view is and the view of people I read is that that's not the case. So again it's just uh, a caution that anthropology needs to take on the hard questions about other cultures. Um, some aspects of those cultures of course being tremendous are tremendously um, successful through time and other aspects of culture that, um, and gender relations is one of them, uh, may need to be um, addressed honestly. Mm -hmm. mm. Just a, a short reminder to, to ask questions online and, and we'll, we'll answer them on here. We might move on to another question that had a lot of feedback in the, in the run up to this uh, live stream.
which comes from T. And T's question was about data collection. How do anthropologists collect data, uh, quantitative, qualitative ways, but also how do they use it, compare it, and then store it for future generations? So what happens to all the field notes that we may have accrued uh, in the field um, once we you know, may have published on it, but we don't publish on everything? Uh, we may move on to other projects, other um, research interests. What happens to that wealth of information? Um, let me start with Richard. What do you do with your field notes? <laughs> uh, well, I write them up very carefully and I <laughs> preserve them as best as I'm able so that they're interpretable by other people. Um, it's inevitably a partial record, I guess, of the kinds of situations you've been in. And uh, sometimes uh, the kind of experiential nature of those situations is meaningful. So, for example, last week I was back in the Gulf at a rodeo and, um, and a rodeo is an event in that area that brings white people, Aboriginal people, and other tourists and others together. Uh, so how do, you, how do you convey that in field notes? It's one thing to transcribe an interview. Uh, how do you capture the experience of being at a rodeo in Burketown in 2014? So for example, I took a lot of photographs, uh, took some video, and um, tried to write up my impressions and then coming back to the office also trying to write about it, think about how it might reflect on some of the issues that you want to address in your research. Um, and then, yeah, you produce an archive of sorts, so, so video, images, audio recordings and notes, and then try to, try to preserve that and make it available for yourself but also potentially uh, being aware of, of other audiences that might have an interest. So, for example, in legal context, maybe not with the tremendous interest in the intercultural dynamics of a rodeo, but in some of the native title and other applied work that we've done, being aware that, that um, anthropological field notes and writing, sort of particularly, I guess, report writing, published writing, has a kind of afterlife in that way. Mm. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about this legal issue because I think it's quite, it's not something most anthropologists um, mm. <laughs> encounter, it's something specific to, to people working in Aboriginal Australia and spe specifically in native title. Well these days, <coughs> yeah, there's a lot of applied research in, in native title uh, which is to do with Aboriginal people seeking to get rights in land. This has been paralleled in other countries at different times. There was uh, quite a lot of involvement of anthropology in Canada and in the US, to a lesser extent in New Zealand where it's been historians more, South Africa historians perhaps more than anthropologists. But um, certainly uh, on that point, um, anthropology's been very vigorous in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, in applied work as well as academic work, so people are engaged and commissioned to carry out some research and then their reports and their ethnographic data get looked at by claimants, by Aboriginal people making claims to country and by their legal representatives and by the courts and by judges and so on. Um, and perhaps I just add one, one thing, I think when you move anthropological data into a setting outside the discipline. Uh, some find it frustrating to deal with, and this includes lawyers, but it also includes other academic colleagues in criminology or sociology or uh, less so history, because like anthropology, you know, history's data is somewhat difficult to tie down. It's not systematic in the way data are that result from uh, administering a questionnaire with precise questions as, as might be done in a discipline like quantitative sociology. So I've had colleagues over the years genuinely puzzled if I've come back from some field work or going on field work, I've had people say to me, and so what did you do when you went there? You know, because, because an anthropologist isn't paying as much attention as some other social science colleagues to a specifically defined question and certainly in the form of a hypothesis say, 
and, and also a research instrument, which is like a questionnaire or a series of questions which has been taken and will systematically be administered to an identified population, sometimes which might be a random sample, you know, in terms of statistical representativeness. So ethnographic data and the data that anthropologists use, as Richard was saying, you know, field notes, writing, photographs, video, vision, um, notes that the researcher writes after an event, after going to the rodeo, which inevitably are filtered through their own subjectivity. Mm. So one of, the, one of the classic things that's said about method and data in anthropology is that the researcher actually has to use their own subjectivity as the research instrument to interpret what's going on. Um, so we get into interesting discussions about what are objective data and what are subjective data. Mm. Mm -hmm. We might come back to that in a second, sure. because two questions have just come in that are actually related to what we do, but also relate back to the first question, I guess. Mm. One is from F9, who says, when we talk about Aboriginal people's education, we only talk in terms of our education system. They and their culture undergo a very deep ongoing education relative to their culture and world views. If we suddenly had to live in their world, which is what anthropologists do, our education would not be fully relevant and we would need to be educated by them, question mark. And I think that's what all anthropologists undergo, this sort of uh, process of being a child in, a, in an alien culture and having, having to start from scratch, learning the language, learning the culture. Um, but I think it relates to Kurt's question, who says, are there any Aboriginal anthropologists in Australia that are actively studying and publishing on white culture as they interpret it. Mm. Now, David, you said earlier we shouldn't always just focus on Aboriginal culture mm. and what happens there. Also think about um, non-Aboriginal cultures that have lived in these places in relationship to Aboriginal communities. Mm. Um, so is the native writing back? Great question. And uh, some of my colleagues who are Aboriginal people studying anthropology and other social sciences, I've had discussions with them over the years to say, I can understand your imperative to want to work, let's say, on the subject of Indigenous cultures and, and the experience of Aboriginal people, but, you know, would you like to, what, what, do you have any interest in, in writing about the other, in writing about um, whitefellas or in writing about suburbs in Australia. So, I mean, my short answer is to say there is some. I'd like to see more. I think when we have in anthropology that happening, it is really interesting. I'm reminded of um, uh, some anthrop an anthropologist from Papua New Guinea who went to study uh, city culture in America, in American cities, and brought to bear his understanding of family life and family relations from PNG um, to try to work out what's the nature of family life in America. Um, and I recall him trying to work out um, how important family connectedness and relatives and so on is in, in American society. And uh, the process of watching that young anthropologist come to grips with that was very interesting indeed. I recall, though he was starting to come to a conclusion that it family wasn't as immediate for American citizens, perhaps, as in his home, because people move a lot more and are more mobile. But then he ref was reflecting on how uh, Americans typically leave their property to family members. So there were overlaps as well as differences. So I think it's a great question. And um, yes, I would like to encourage more, uh, more people, more Aboriginal people and people from other cultures around the world to to study um, others. Mm. Mm. I think something to add to that response as well is to take it back to the very first episode of this MOOC where we interviewed a range of anthropologists about uh, the role of anthropology as they envisioned it and had a lot of discussion on the discussion board in response to Daniel Goldstein's comment that anthropology needs to be in service of more vulnerable populations. So I'm not wanting to generalise right across Aboriginal communities in Australia. Um, obviously there are really diverse experiences there uh, but if you look at health stati statistics, for instance, I mean, the life expectancy of Aboriginal Australians is 20 years less than other Australians. Um, and so I think that in terms of using um, a perspective like Daniel's to look at um, who is producing anthropological knowledge um, and about whom, 
Um, in some ways, that there's, there's that sort of relevance there. In other ways, I'd also like to, to contest that particular power dynamic. I think that it's also really important uh, to look at anthropologies of, of dominant cultures and to have knowledge that's produced by a whole range of different voices and a whole range of different actors that occupy uh, different positions in society. So I think that we've seen anthropology um, looking at particular, uh, particular groups or particular populations, but we are starting to see that shift, and I think that that shift is really positive. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, follow on from Kurt, um, we'll get a reference to that PNG work and we'll, we'll put it up, and, and maybe some, hopefully, some open access materials um, to relate to that. Because that was a really interesting aspect. Because there's a long running debate in terms of studying your own society versus studying the other, mm. but the other studying your home society mm. is something we'd really sort of engage in. Mm. Um, going on from this, I think the, uh, another th third question that had a lot of um, discussion around it in, in, in the lead up to this uh, was really two questions that we've sort of brought together, one from Micah Beekman and Kate MM65. Um, mm. And together, they're, they're really asking about the consequences to what they term original cultures or indigenous cultures um, to contact. Um, and most of the contact is colonial times, but how that contact has played out over time um, in terms of often around economic development for land or the sort of negotiations over um, ancestral resources such as land uh, in exchange for mining rights, for instance. And in this example, she was talking about um, the Navajo tribe um, getting $500 million, but I think it's something that happens around the world where indigenous people who might have uh, a claim over a particular piece of land um, have to negotiate um, giving up land for, for economic development. And how, more broadly, that, ne that negotiation or that, uh, that contact plays out, whether they then you know, their culture is destroyed, gets assimilated by the influx of, of, of other people, or whether they themselves become isolated in reservations, for instance, um, mm. off their original land, um, and, and what impacts that has on their cultural identity. Um, it's a very broad question, but I think maybe if we can just talk about some of the um, experiences you've had in, in places that you've worked in, and how that's played out. Uh, well, briefly, I mean, um, the, it's reflecting back on that question about education as well, which we didn't really answer, but it links to this. Um, it's just so important to be aware that following these processes of settlement and colonization in different parts of the world, indigenous cultures don't exist in a bubble separate from the wider economy and the wider society and of course, over time, there are different paces of change, mm. but it's so important for people studying anthropology to be as much alive to potential desires on the part of young people, certainly these days, young Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, whether in the US or Canada or, or Australia, who have aspirations for careers and for finding ways out of poverty, if that's their circumstances. Um, I'm reminded by, of an Indigenous colleague who some years ago wrote about what he called um, Indigenous capitalism, I think some, something like that. You know, he wanted to make the point that in a, in a rich country like Australia, young Aboriginal people um, may well feel very positive, positive about embracing aspects of the wider society, especially things which are going to be uh, of material advantage, just like any other young people. So that's the qualification. I mean, at the same time, of course, as anthropologists, we're very aware of the desire of the descendants of the colonised, if you like, to reproduce and maintain a sense of separate identity and, and, and a sense of separate culture. But I always try to encourage uh, students to look realistically at the desires to embrace and to mix and to move on and to change. Um, not, not all aspects of inherited traditions are good for people, but more to the point uh, are things that everybody always wants to maintain and Aboriginal people are no different.
So I hope that addresses in part. And I, on the education question, then, yes, there are, of course, bodies of knowledge variously across the world that are, are different and distinct among the descendants of, of those indigenous societies colonised. But in a, in a country like Australia in 2014, um, you know, all Aboriginal people uh, also overlap with and share aspects of the wider Australian education system. And it is, in fact, um, the capacity of children to uh, be able to operate in that system and, and learn um, to, to read and write in English and to get on in formal education that is as important, you would say, as the inheritance of their separate cultural knowledge. Mm. Friends, you? Well, I was actually just wanting to go back to the idea of um, Indigenous continuing Indigenous relationships to land and to country and to natural resources and how that might have changed given these sorts of changes that David is outlining. So the fact that Indigenous cultures don't exist within a bubble, that there is a, a wider Australian economy at play that in Australia, like in many other nations, like the US and Canada, um, there's, a, there's a great big mining sector in there. And so I think that we do need to look at these relationships between um, um, between indigenous communities and mining companies and the sorts of uh, power dynamics and ethical interplay that, that's, that's formed within those relationships. Obviously, again, there's a huge diversity of... And, and it's not always, you know, when we talk about indigenous communities and or Aboriginal people, that they amongst themselves agree over mm -hmm. should there be mining on this land, for instance, that you have internal conflicts too, often coming out of education and different... Mm. Uh, pathways that they see or want to see for, for their mm. community. Yeah, and I think that really speaks as well to David's point that we need to avoid uh, romanticising Indigenous cultures or seeing them as trapped within a historical bubble um, mm. and, and engaged solely in, um, in what we'd term traditional economic exchange, and that's simply not the case in Australia anymore. And it is really divisive within Aboriginal communities. I don't think that any of us have worked with an Aboriginal community that's entirely united on any particular way of, of um, engaging with economic development or using natural resources that are found mm. on their land. I mean, it's, it's a hugely contentious point. Yeah, I think the concepts of continuity, change, tradition, they're, um, they're rich and meaningful to explore and I think that um, we need to be careful about using them and, and avoiding sort of entrapping people within either category as traditional people or, or as people of change and start to think about the kind of intercultural context in which traditions are reproduced and recreated or, or created for the first time and, um, and I think it's important politically to allow people a bit of wriggle room and not try and put them in a, in a place uh, where they need to be traditional to for example get recognition from the state as authentic indigenous mm. people or to get rights and interests. We need to, to have a sophisticated approach to the sorts of changes and the sorts of ways in which change occurs. Um, I think if we're going to do the right thing and, and write honestly and, and appropriately about society, I, even in places like the Gulf Country or Arnhem Land or in the desert, we need to, to, to deal very carefully and with these concepts, I think. Mm. To change tack a little bit, I've got a very simple question now, or it, it sounds very simple, um, from Malav Lee. Um, is anthropology a science? Very simple question <laughs> that I'll just throw out there for <laughs> everyone to have a quick mull over. Let's start with you, David. I'd say yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> On the yes side, uh, it shares with some with the other sciences, with the natural sciences, um, the fundamental idea of finding out about the world empirically, of obtaining information which generates conclusions. Um, where it differs from the natural sciences is that people are not predictable in the same way. So in anthropology, we can't formulate 
a law like we can a law of gravity. So in, in physics, we know if we hold something up and drop it, it will always fall. If it doesn't fall, we're in a little bit of trouble and, and, uh, and certainly the scientists would be um, <laughs> dealing with that. I think we're all a little bit disturbed. Yeah. In anthropology and in the study of human societies and cultures, we can come up with generalizations that are probabilistic. So we can do work and we can say, look, on the basis of this, you know, there's a, there's a probability that uh, the simple thing is, um, it's not only in anthropology, but if you, if you, you might have a, gen a probabilistic generalization that people with a certain level of wealth might vote for a certain kind of political party. Um, but of course, it doesn't always hold. It's not a law. It's a generalization based on a statistical association between lots of people with more money voting in a certain way. Mm. So uh, I think that it's important for anthropology to identify itself as a social science, but it's connected mm. strongly to the humanities as well because of what I said before about the inevitable subjectivity of interpretations about what the world means to people. Um, in the end, though, I, I mean, I'm a certain kind of anthropologist. There are some who may well say, uh, I'm not sure whether it's covered in the MOOC so far, that um, they're quite comfortable with the fact that they go into a certain setting and do a study and come up with conclusions. And another anthropologist might go there afterwards and come up with completely different conclusions. I'm a little worried about that. I would like... <laughs> I would like my conclusions to be sufficiently grounded in what I will recall <laughs> empirical fact such that the other anthropologist who comes in, you know, may differ, but there will be sufficient overlap for us, for us to be able to yeah. say, uh, you know, we're, we're both doing social science. Huh. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to raise a different point, which is... I thought you might. <laughs> yeah, which, which in part I think might um, contradict what David's just said, just in part. I think there'll be significant overlap. We've probably got some common ground. But uh, there was a... I think, Richard, actually, you put it really beautifully in the interview that you gave for the MOOC, that um, not even between different anthropologists, but over the course of one's fieldwork as an, as an anthropologist, we ourselves are changed by the relationships that we form with people, that we form with the landscape, um, or whatever it is that we might be interacting with over the course of that field work. So I'd even argue that not only is it difficult for different anthropologists to see the same thing and reach the same conclusions um, if they go to the same field site, but that one individual anthropologist would more than likely come up with a slightly different perspective or different point of view mm -hmm. or different conclusions, whether they're at the start of their field work or the end of their field work or depending on their own life experiences. And I think that that relates to what you were talking about as um, subjectivity uh, being a, uh, the lens or the framework through which we examine it, data as, as anthropologists. I think that's inescapable and, and fluid as well. So you're comfortable in contradicting yourself between <laughs> sets of conclusions you would go and do a study, you'd come up with conclusions, but next year you'd contradict those. Well, I think that it would be more important to revise one's conclusions if you, if you did start to disagree with your previous conclusions rather than holding to mm. a mm. position that you'd changed over the course of your fieldwork. I don't think that that would be an honest way of engaging mm. with fieldwork or, or presenting data as an anthropologist. So I, I would be more comfortable with changing than I would with holding a static mm. point of view. Well, I think that <laughs> it's important to also have a way to defend your propositions and conclusions. So if you say, for example, you know, this happened because there was this tension in this time at this place, you know, there's a, there's a substance to it and people can call you out on that and, and sort of say, oh, yeah, but have you factored in this, this thing over here? And, and certainly in some of the contexts that uh, David and I have worked where, where your conclusions or your opinions are, um, are tested and are confronted and are challenged, it's important to be able to, to, be able to justify them without, of course, saying that you know, this is this is a definitive um, thing that we can rise mm -hmm. that we can raise above our own 
um, engagements with people in the field. I think you just mentioned a word that's a bit of a tagline for the course, right? Context is everything and context change. And yeah. therefore, our estimation or our understanding of what is happening mm. will change. And I, I, I'm with Fern on this one, I'm afraid. Um, but it was <laughs> interesting in the, in, the, in the first week, and it's, it's not about counting votes here, but it was interesting <laughs> in the first uh, couple of videos we had, I think the majority of anthropologists we interviewed were of the ilk probably tending towards more towards the humanities. And anthropology is not a science. It's more about storytelling. It's about engaging, being active, uh, sometimes politically active. Um, but there, there were, was one or two who actually said anthropology is a science, and we can make these um, almost laws um, uh, who have a more of a quantitative tradition, um, partly coming out of political science, or the, that sort mm -hmm. of an overlap. Um, of a very robust social science. So I think, but again, you know, as anthropologists, I think one of the great things about anthropology is that we're open. We're open to uh, lots of different uh, methodologies. We're open to lots of different approaches. And so there's always going to be a large diversity of opinion that's just amongst mm. the four of us, which mm. is very good. Um, we've just had a question come in which relates to this in a way. Um, Antonio25 asks, how does anthropology deal with political ideology like right and left? Again, something we can probably talk, uh, talk about for a very long time. Um, very briefly. Wh very briefly. What's your take? <laughs> <laughs> very briefly, my take is that anthropologists should not impose their own political ideology. They can do that in other aspects of their lives, but when they are carrying out research mm. to investigate the world, uh, and come to conclusions about what people believe or how they behave, then it's dangerous and risky and in fact uh, it comes undone if the, if the researcher imposes their own political position. Then of course there are political positions among those with whom we study, with whom we engage in research and that's another matter and we document those to the right or the left or, or whatever. I think anthropologists would try to do more than just document political positions and sort of explain, explain where they come from. But the, the other thing I'll just add quickly is if we want to be useful in the world outside mm. of universities and outside academia and we want to be taken seriously, then uh, we need to present results and conclusions that are both not seen as just being driven by the political position of the researcher and secondly are not conclusions that we say well you know I've come up with these conclusions but it's not really factual somebody else might find something else and if the anthropologist says that in a court of law or in a in a contested negotiation then we will find that others other disciplines, uh, other, others in the law and so on will say, well, that's pretty useless. If, mm. you, if you can't tell us what exists, you know, if you're just going to tell us that, well, uh, we're telling a story and somebody else is going to come along and tell another story, <laughs> story, they'll say, well, thank you very much, but we'll, we'll find other kinds of uh, social scientists to work with. Yeah. But going back to that question very briefly, one of the first things we learn in anthropology is that we all have cultural baggage. That's very difficult to, we, we can't actually go into the mm. field <coughs> and do our work objectively, 100% mm. objectively. We're always going to have our own cultural baggage. And part of that cultural baggage is perhaps not a, a political ideology, but some, some form of politics, our own politics. And it, it doesn't have to be left or right. It can be a mixture of those. But our own politics invariably, I think, seeps into the work we do it might be the driver of why we do the work at all. Um, how, how do you overcome that? Uh, I think researchers, just as much as possible, need to be aware of um, what their own personal positions are on things. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but if I, I, I would say that anthropology is strong on cultural relativism, but actually that doesn't mean moral relativism necessarily. So mm. to add on a little bit more, you know, I talked about gender violence before. I've asked myself over the years, mm. um, okay, I'm a cultural relativist. I, I, I want to be open to whatever's happening in this situation, but that doesn't mean I will suspend all moral judgments as a person. And my moral judgments may well seep into 
uh, my writing an account of what happens. It's a difficult one. I mean, I think it's, um, as we've said, it's a, we use our own subjectivity as a researched instrument. And, mm. But I guess I, you know, to be blunt about it, I'm somewhat critical of colleagues for whom the research exercise mainly becomes a vehicle for the promotion of their own political mm. position. I don't think that's right. I, I think, as I said in some of the videoing we did earlier for the MOOC, um, I've been very aware over the years, working in a lot of settings, that I'm not the one who continues to live there afterwards. So I want to be very cautious about imposing my own political position. Mm. What about, this is, this is a question upon a question rather than a response, although I did want to say um, as a sort of more run-of-the-mill response to the question of how anthropology deals with political ideology like right and left, uh, that there were a couple of anthropologists that we um, interviewed as part of the MOOC, so Jeffrey Juris is one that comes to mind, um, Daniel Goldstein, also David Graeber who we didn't interview, but they're examples of anthropologists who specifically look at a particular uh, part of the political spectrum, so, so especially social movements of the left, have become um, the very subject of focus for, for certain anthropologists, similarly with political movements of the right, although I can't um, think of any anthropologists off the top of my head. Uh, but I did want to ask about uh, a question that engaged a lot of discussion on the discussion boards mm. as part of this course, uh, was about anthropologists not necessarily bringing their own political agenda into the field, but whether or not it's morally defensible for anthropologists to engage with the political agendas of the people that they're working with. So anthropologists as advocates, in a sense, mm -hmm. or anthropologists as um, social justice workers, was sort of the term that got thrown around a bit. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, if any of you have a, a contribution to make on that debate. Well, briefly, uh, yeah, I, th I think that anthropologists can can become advocates. I mean, the challenge is in advocating without foregoing or, or compromising the kind of strength and and robustness of your ethnography and your anthropology. In some some ways, you know, you can think of them as separate ways in which people live their lives in the field. That you know, doing anthropology doing advocacy work, but at the same time, absolutely, uh, your, your, yourself drives in a lot of ways your engagements with other people, of course it does, and, mm. and you can't disavow that or resolve from that. Mm. But I think, yeah, I mean, I sort of lean towards David's view, and I think it's important to remember that it's hard to be uh, instrumental about what anthropologists or where anthropology goes and mm. and I look sometimes at old anthropological writing in the context of native title claims and land negotiations and sometimes the work done for a completely different reason becomes meaningful and and significant in pursuit of a, of a, of a new agenda mm. so we need to be aware that that there are different audiences for our work and not to try and not to try and restrict that to mm. to to the fellow-minded uh, on the political spectrum, for example. Mm. Well, I think that was something that uh, one of your interviewees in the Gulf Country touched on, wasn't it? That there are a lot of members of their community that are really appreciative of the work that anthropologists have done there over the decades because they've had a role in preserving history and pre preserving stories, and that has become important politically in a different way to how people might have imagined at the outset of of doing mm. that work, which is another thing that I wonder about in terms of the ethics of becoming involved in a community, and that was a point that came up as well, is um, can, we, can we morally uh, become engaged within a community without um, giving something to that community? And often what a community um, asks for, whether or not that's explicit, and again, I'm thinking of, of the interview with Daniel Goldstein here, is some kind of advocacy for a p particular political agenda. So what if those sorts of situations come up where people don't accept that anthropologists can just be there as neutral observers? Like that's, that, that feels like an imposition mm. on a community mm. rather, than, rather than a fair exchange. I, yeah, I mean, negotiating a research setting, no matter where it is, 
is always going to involve that sort of stuff and I think it's not going to be just with less powerful groups either. If we're negotiating a research project with the police force, they're going to want to ask us questions about what we're getting out of it and certainly how our work may impact on their work and, mm. Mm. and their lives. I mean, that's just one example. Uh, so I think um, people take their baggage in and if, if a person's baggage, if you like, is to be a social justice advocate, that's fine and they just need to be upfront about that. Um, and they need to make judgments, anthropologists need to make judgments about, a whole, about the usefulness of their advocacy and, and um, important judgments about whether um, this is a nice way, say, for the researcher coming in from the outside to feel good about themselves, thinking of themselves as an advocate as against foreshadowing actual practical outcomes. So if you're a social justice advocate in Aboriginal Australia, you can do a whole lot of symbolic posturing as an anthropologist, but um, you may achieve a much greater uh, by, by doing a, being engaged to do a report which is presented as independent work mm -hmm. of a social science kind which people can rely on and which can be used in the negotiation over a big mine or something like that. So we have to think in my view, how we want to position our work. Um, if we go, if, in my experience, doing advocacy work tends to position ourselves sort of with, with other advocates or with those parts of the research setting who are interested in the advocacy, but we may distance ourselves from powerful institutions in the society. Mm. Anthropology, if anthropology is not seen by the law courts and by politicians as a reliable social science but as a bunch of social justice advocates then it may distance and diminish our capacity for practical effect. Mm. I mean I'm not arguing, I, I perfectly accept that some anthropologists will believe that advocacy is part of what they do but I'm just saying they need to be upfront about it from the beginning in negotiating with the research setting and try to be as uh, as clear as possible about foreshadowing what it's actually going to achieve. Mm. 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 I mean, in my work, I've written something about the difficulty of, of working with, let's say, Muslim fundamentalists. Mm. It was much easier working with Muslim moderates because I, I agreed with most of what I was hearing mm. and it was much more confronting. And I think for anthropologists, there's always a bit, you always come in with a bias and it's about negotiating and realizing where you're coming from and how that is impacting your work mm -hmm. and how to, how to be honest about that, I guess, in what you write and how to work mm. through those different levels. Mm -hmm. um, same with working with refugees. And in fact, it, it often, I think th there is a, a slight difference in, in audience. You, I think when you write, you, you have as an audience the legal establishment on one level that potentially is always an audience. Whereas for me, it rarely ever, or I don't think at all, so I don't write with that in mind. Uh, and I think it's, it, does, it is a factor in how we write about things mm. and how we, we, we yeah, talk about Yeah, but you can do things. both. I mean, applied anthropologists who work in Aboriginal Australia, or mm. they, work, they write academic, for academic journals and an academic readership as well as, or not all, but it's perfectly, it's perfectly feasible to do to more than one thing. Mm. Um, maybe just one last question from the... Um, the discussion forum sort of ties in with what we've been talking about um, and it, it's two questions from Common Man and Coco Lion One um, about opportunities for careers in anthropology and who funds anthropological studies. How do we actually get to do mm. what we do? Um, and again, we'll have different answers to this <laughs> because we're in different <laughs> settings, which is, but maybe just because we're also running out of time, so I'm conscious mm. of both these things very briefly, um, go through that. Well, I'll just make a very brief comment. I mean, it varies in different countries, across countries, where funding comes from. In some countries, there's government funding. I mean, funding for anthropology is the same source from government as funding for other research in the natural sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. In countries like Australia, and I would add at certain times Brazil and Canada and so on, where, where there are funds from other sources because... Um, 
of the practical import potentially of the research that anthropologists are engaged to do. So in Australia, there are more people working, calling themselves anthropologists working outside the academy than inside the academy these days. They do somewhat different kinds of work, although some like some of us do both. And so we get funding from, du from multiple sources. Mm. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it's the same for you in doing similar work. Yeah, I think it's a challenge to, to put your research and your questions across to, to people who might be interested in paying for, to, to investigate them and then producing something that's meaningful to, to them as well as hopefully academic colleagues and not sort of siloing yourself in, in either. Mm. I guess uh, in my personal experience, um, there are a lot of different um, places. There are a lot of different sorts of bodies that I've worked for. So I've worked as an anthropologist for the state government, uh, for a private um, cultural heritage company. Uh, but the anthropological work that I've been involved in um, that I also feel very passionately about is also self-funded. So I think that's a thing that um, might not have been mentioned mm. yet either, is independent <laughs> freelance anthropological work and writing um, is a thing that also exists as well. <laughs> People doing it for the passion, I think that <laughs> happens too, um, with, with, with very little or no resources coming their way. I think that's part of the picture too. Um, and we talked in the interview with Sarah Kenzie a little bit, bit about the U.S. situation in terms of the adjunctification, where there's less and less jobs at university, which used to be sort of the natural place for, mm. for people in mm. anthropology to find a home and an income, mm. and that's increasingly not the case. Mm. Uh, it hasn't been for a while, especially in the U.S., where there's people working, we talked about this, the human terrain system for the military, <coughs> for private contractors, for marketing companies, and again, that's the majority of anthropology graduates. Um, because the universities aren't there to, to take yeah. every graduate. But I think anthropology is one of those um, uh, careers or one of those um, degrees that actually um, m makes students or makes graduates able to work in a range of fields because mm. the tools that they acquire doing an anthropology degree mm. are actually, you know, you can use them in, a, in such a wide variety of, of settings because they, they're, they're tools for life rather than for a specific profession. Mm. Uh, I don't think anthropology has ever only educated people for the profession. Mm. Uh, so I think that's hopefully a positive note to end on. I'm afraid we have to end it here. Thank you very much for everyone out there who joined us um, on the live stream. We'll have another live stream at the end of the course to reflect upon the whole course, but also that third module that's starting this weekend, uh, Life Within Limits, where we'll be going to Cuba, um, to Chile, and to Malaysia. So thank you very much for, to all of you on the panel and all of those online, um, and see you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.